Hi everyone, my name's Connor McDonald. This is how you tweet me, this is where I live, and this is what we're talking about today, avoiding never-ending locks. As a developer, when you're building and supporting applications, nothing is worse than the following site. Remember before iPhones it used to be an hourglass or a progress bar? Now that little swirly thing is the nightmare icon on screen. I actually had to Google to find out the official name of it. It's called an infinite progress indicator, and infinite sometimes is a really appropriate term. Nothing is more frustrating for the user because there's no action they can really take to solve it. What do most of us do? We normally close the app down or reboot and just try again. This sort of sounds strange, but this is actually the sort of problem where we actually hope that it's a SQL performance issue, because normally solving performance issues like that, they can be pretty easy to fix in a rapid time frame. So you get a bit of a solution for the user quickly. You might be able to add an index quickly or change the SQL or add a baseline or even manipulate the optimizer statistics. So to work out what's going on, we can jump onto the database or ask the DBA to and run a query on VDL or session. And we see this and we discover that it's a much more dangerous type of problem, one that can be very hard to solve quickly. The example you can see from VDL or session is that session 39 has been active for, inactive for 376 seconds. Session 46 is the one that has the infinite progress indicator, and we can see that he's been blocked by session 39. Session 46 is trying to lock the rows in the empt table, you can see from the select statement, and he's blocked. So even though session 39 is inactive, it must have some uncommitted transactions on the empt table, which is at the heart of the issue. I suppose at this stage you start thinking about all those stats you see on the web about, you know, if customers don't get a response within three seconds, they leave your website, and you'd start to panic. So what would happen in times of the past is we would encounter the wrath of the DBA. They would get buzzed on their pager, but luckily times have changed by now, so we don't have pages anymore, so this is what happens instead. So yeah, maybe times actually haven't changed so much after all. The net result is the same. The DBA gets up in the middle of the night, runs an alter system kill session to remove the session causing the problems, or they might kill the process at the operating system level, but most importantly, they'll go back to sleep and then they'll make a mental note to come visit you in the morning and probably deal out some you know, harsh justice. So how do we avoid it? How do we avoid causing that pain for the customer? How do we avoid causing that pain for the DBA? Because both of those things probably end up being pain for us in some way, shape or form. In, total, in terms of total correctness, we probably want to be looking at avoiding those issues altogether. And we might be thinking about design changes or code changes. But in emergency situations, we might need to do something quickly so the problem can be mitigated while we work on a proper solution. So maybe we need an interim solution. Now most developers are aware of select for update, this being the thing that causes the locks, but not many people are aware of an enhancement that came into SQL way back in version 9. It was the ability to set a timeout on the select for update. In this case, I could wait for up to 60 seconds before giving up. So what happens if I try to get a lock? I'll try wait for up to 60 seconds, and if I don't succeed, I'll get Aura 30006 resource busy. Now you're probably thinking, big deal. Like, what's the difference? My application still isn't working, it's still crashed. Well, by default in Oracle, locks wait forever to be acquired. So you might start off with a situation like we just saw before. Session 39 has a lock but it's inactive. Session 46 is blocked. But then sessions 56 and 58 might come along. They might be blocked on 39 as well. Now those sessions might have open transactions in their own right. So all of a sudden, sessions 62, 63, 67, 71, they get blocked on 46, and that blocks session 78, and it's very easy for this whole thing to escalate into a giant system-wide disaster. That's very public and very embarrassing for you. When it comes to locks, forever is a long, long time to wait. In this case, crashing is actually a good thing. There's an old saying we use in software development, crash early and crash often. By having a request for a lock actually crash, we gain some control over the process. We can even add some value as part of that process. For example, we might create a database trigger that fires after server error, which contains, if we get an Aura 30006, let's go mine some session data, get their username, their machine name, etc., and we could pass that back as part of the error. So let's say this was a company internal application. When I can't get a lock, I can let the user know why they couldn't get it. Here's an error saying, you know, I couldn't get the lock, go speak to Connor, he's on extension 1234, give him a phone call, ask him what he's doing with his application. This is win-win. This is empowering for the user because they get to take some control over the application, they get to phone me in the next office and tell me to get the hell off my application. 
It's empowering for us as developers because now we can track these problems, recover from them, and while we work to a permanent solution. And guess what? We're empowering the DBAs because they'll be much more keen to help us if we can let them slip in peace. Now that's the end of part one where you've seen how to use select for update with the wait timeout. Stay tuned for part two and we'll see how this works when we discuss the subject of deadlocks. Thanks for watching. See you again in a second.